Good afternoon and uh, welcome to everybody. My name is Simon Reed Henry and it's my privilege as Director of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences to welcome you all to this online discussion on the legacy of Occupy 10 years later. The IHSS was established in 2018 to bring together scholars from across the faculty's eight schools to share ideas, develop new research and explore innovative approaches to scholarly and public problems alike. And it's a real pleasure to welcome to the IHSS today three fantastic speakers from both sides of the Atlantic who bring both critical reflection and first-hand experience of the wave of public sit-ins and occupations that swept around the world in 2011. Now I'll introduce them each in a moment but first just to remind you all that this is a recorded event so you can catch up with it or spread the word later if you go to our website which is www.qmul.ac.uk forward slash IHSS. Audience members here with us today are welcome to pose questions in the chat, and I can put those to the panelists a little later on. We aim to finish on time in an hour and a half and look forward to a fascinating conversation today. A reminder of today's topic, a decade ago, on the back of a global financial crisis and the Indignados movement in Spain, activists set up camp in Zugotti Park in New York's financial district, bearing slogans of opposition to the unjust power and privilege of the 1%, a message of economic inequality. In so doing, they sparked a global cascade of Occupy movements. The implications have been extraordinary, and we have the best possible group of speakers to digest it all for us here today. We have, first of all, Michael Levedin, author of the recently released book, Generation Occupy, Reawaking American Democracy. Michael is a journalist, author, and professor, and co-founding editor of the Occupied Wall Street Journal, which now has its own entry in the Smithsonian. Then we have Sarah Jaffe, the author of two books, Work Won't Love You Back, How Devotion to Our Jobs Keeps Us Exploited, Exhausted, and Alone, and Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, which put Occupy alongside a range of movements, including also the likes of the Tea Party. Sarah's co-host of Descent Magazine's belabored podcast with Michelle Chan and an independent journalist and type media reporting fellow. And last but not least, we have our own Sam Halverson, a good friend as well as a valued colleague. Sam is senior lecturer in human geography at Queen Mary. He's a Latin Americanist and an urban political theorist who's written on the territorial politics of grassroots urban politics. He did part of his PhD on Occupy London, and his current research examines uneven political participation in Latin American cities. Previously, he was involved in uh, the Occupy movement beyond uh, also the UK. And so the format for today's event is that Michael, Sarah and Sam are each going to address the topic for around 15 minutes, bringing in some of their own reflections on the legacy of Occupy to date. We'll then have a chance to engage in a group conversation and perhaps get into one or two themes that particularly interest me in this whole discussion before we throw it open to the floor. And at that point, you'll all be welcome to bring your questions. But let me turn first of all to you, Michael. Your book offers a great starting point for us today, tracking the influence on everything from climate politics to labor to generations. But even just introducing you all now and going through the outlines of some of your books and your articles and your contributions over the past decade, it's incredible, really, what a tumultuous period it's been in terms of the range and the diversity of movements. I grew up politically at least, in the 90s, when literally what we had was no logo. And that I think is one thing that really strikes me is just the sheer transformation in the political landscape and the energy that was brought to it. And so the question I guess that we start with when we come to you is, what was Occupy in that transformation? How critical and pivotal was it? And what other, I guess, longer term trends in a sense did it pick up upon and pressures that have perhaps been there for a long time? Uh, waitering and simmering away. Michael, we're really looking forward to hearing your contributions. Your book's a wonderful contribution. I recommend it to, to all of the audience here today. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to what you now have to say. So Michael, over to you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Simon, and welcome to everyone taking part in this talk. Uh, I'm really glad that, uh, that the University of the Queen Mary chose to highlight this subject that I've been thinking about for the past decade, but, uh, but many in the mainstream media are not. Um, that's a great starting point, Simon. Um, I think looking back at recent activism is a necessary place to start to, to, to put Occupy in the context and why it was so meaningful. Um, as you say, the 90s, I grew up in that time as well. I was an environmental activist at that point. 
I was waiting for our generation to show up. We felt that the 90s when Al Gore was our vice president, he had written a book about the climate, the coming climate emergency, earth and the balance. We had a new democratic leadership with Bill Clinton. It was out of the Reagan and Bush years and we really had hopes that, uh, that there was going to be a sea change and in uh, addressing the climate crises, the social justice, economic justice crises. Instead, we got uh, the tech boom and we got uh, a, a kind of period of unbridled economic sort of growth and Wall Street greed took off in the 90s, uh, continued to take off as it had in the 80s. And we sort of missed this window. And I think that the anti-globalization movement that was really vibrant in the 90s was it was a precursor to Occupy, but it kind of didn't uh, achieve what it hoped. It had the Battle of Seattle in 1999, was sort of the culmination um, of these protests that brought labor and environmentalists together and young people and people of all demographics around the world at various protests. But what we had following uh, the 90s was 9-11 in America, what was first a stolen presidential election, followed by 9-11, followed by the Iraq war. People protested that war around the world, in the UK as much as anywhere, to say, no, we don't want to support this war. But Tony Blair, along with George Bush, went to war. And it kind of sucked the oxygen out of the room. Activism sort of got it was diminished in a real way by those the 2000s when America was at war with Britain in the Middle East. And um, all of those causes that had gotten so much attention were, were sort of a really back burnered. And what we had then was the housing crash, the housing crisis and the financial crash, followed by the Great Recession and an entire generation that was in uh, sort of enslaved to student debt that was uh, jobless because we had an economy where millions were out of work, families were out of homes. Um, the injustice was deafening um, and it was all caused by our Wall Street banks, uh, assisted by a government regulatory system that hadn't overseen their, their criminal behavior um, in sort of collapsing the global economy. And that's where we found ourselves in 2011 um, following the Arab Spring of that winter, which set off these global revolutions, uh, the Arab Spring, which of course led to the Indignados and the 15M movement in Spain and anti-austerity protests in Greece and across Europe and, and Chile with students marching in Chile and in Israel where they built tent cities. It was called the year of the protester, 2011. It was this outpouring of rage during the Great Recession and it sort of culminated in September 2011 at Occupy Wall Street. Um, I think that I really wrote this book because, and I called it Generation Occupy because, um, you know, like I say, I was waiting for our generation to emerge. We sort of had been a silent generation and we it finally came. And I wasn't intending to cover this movement. I was on my way to Berlin. In fact, where I had been living as a foreign correspondent, but I showed up in New York one week into the movement. It so captivated me, it anchored me to the spot, literally to Zuccotti Park where I moved in and helped start the newspaper of the movement and stayed for the whole year while Occupy was in full swing. Um, I've thought about it ever since. Uh, that was one of the most defining experiences of my life, clearly, as it was for so many. But what I think that most people come away from with Occupy and the memory of it, especially younger people who might not who weren't there physically and who might have only read about it is, uh, and also for all the people who observed and maybe weren't taking part, but who were aware of it, the one lasting legacy that most people think is the 99%, that it gave us this new language of we are the 99%. It set up this new juxtaposition between the powerful elite, the sliver at the very top of society, the one versus the 99%, which essentially was all the rest of us. And while this wasn't a new concept, the way that it was articulated with the blunt, forceful language that Occupy employed in sharp, sort of very meme-like terms, um, you know, tax the rich and corporate greed, people over profits, it developed this new language around inequality that was very easily graspable in a way that despite the injustice, despite the economic inequality people have been experiencing with the Great Recession, it hadn't been articulated in that way.
Um, it just changed the conversation. And as Britain as well was completely locked into this uh, austerity politics and economics of um, we need to, after the recession, we need to tighten our belts and cut programs, cut health spending, cut social spending. The United States was the same, but the moment Occupy hit, that argument was out the window and we've never quite gone back to that. Inequality, economic inequality replaced austerity and it sort of gave life to this new sense of economic demands uh, and, and, and a requirement for greater justice for working people for the 99%. However, uh, like I say, that in a way was the lasting legacy. Most people just remember Occupy, the 99%. And I wrote this book to say, actually, it did a whole lot more. It, the economic shift of the paradigm was the beginning. But in fact, where most people saw the movement disappear and essentially dissipate after several months, the camps were cleared, uh, people went home, police uh, repression of the movement across all of the United States, 7,000 arrests across the US during the course of several months in the fall of 2011, um, combined with a sense of structurelessness and the leaderlessness and the inability to form policy proposals, all of this made Occupy essentially disappear in the public eye. But I just wanted to mention um, essentially three principal ways that I'll talk about here that Occupy profoundly impacted and changed the American cultural and political landscape uh, in ways that I think if people are fair uh, in recognizing it, it would be more widely understood. I think the first and most obvious way, which many people certainly in university today and, and the younger generation that I'm really writing this book for um, would recognize is the way that it transformed activism and, um, and sort of rebirthed a culture of protest that isn't going away. And like Simon started the talk, you know, we didn't have that kind of that form of organizing on the left. Um, so many people I talked to for the book reported and spoke to from Occupy and activists and filmmakers and analysts, so many repeated this idea of, we didn't have any other outlets. Before Occupy, there wasn't really a left. The anti-Iraq war, it had kind of, it, it had smothered that spirit of whatever a young, bolder left that was ready to confront the challenges of climate and inequality and these issues. Occupy spurred, uh, the sense that the people themselves in a horizontal, decentralized way, can they don't have to wait around for someone else to give them the nod and say, okay, why don't you make some noise? They went out and they controlled the media narrative. They didn't wait for the New York Times and CNN uh, and all of the sort of mainstream media to cover it. The mainstream media wasn't covering it. Occupy Wall Street, as I was part of the media crew there, we created the media, we made it a national and quickly a global movement. People in the tech side, people, social media was just coming in. People had just gotten their cell phones in their pockets. Um, iPhones were only several years old. Social media was just flourishing and uh, everybody was on it. So we sort of used this confluence of the technology with the social crisis of the moment to to ex essentially explode this uh, message of, of greater justice and equality. And it went viral. And it was the first movement of that kind to sort of go planetary in a way. Everybody heard of Occupy. It was on, you know, a thousand towns and cities across the, the, the world. Um, and it certainly was vibrant and huge in, in England. I remember Occupy London playing just a, a giant role in terms of spurring the European um, wave of activism in that time. Um, what did it lead to? I mean, just because it disappeared, the Occupy people themselves went to so many other movements following Occupy. They helped spur this new era, this sort of uh, this drive for change. Black Lives Matter emerged three years after Occupy. Many people from Occupy, which had missed the racial justice lens, many people recognize Occupy was about economic inequality and injustice, but it had fallen short and it didn't really know how to incorporate nor did it address really racial justice issues with black lives matter we begin to see this sort of beginning of a confluence and occupy people correcting in a way they contributed to that movement on the tech side organizing protests but it was more sort of what occupy wall street showed could be done in a decentralized city by city movement that black lives matter took 
and developed on and made so much more kind of viral and, and um, right in people's living rooms, forcing people to see the police brutality and, and abuse in communities of color. Um, so much of the technology and the style and the memes and the sharing um, and the city by city nature of uh, Black Lives Matter borrowed from what Occupy had shown could be done in a very different context. And from Black Lives Matter, we just saw this in the middle of last decade, this, this um, eruption we went to Standing Rock, where Native American people were joined by, you know, white young college kids and people from all over the country who migrated to the most isolated point of North Dakota to defend uh, in, in the Sioux Native people, uh, Standing Rock Sioux, against the pipeline. It was the water protectors. It was a new evolution of these protests, and it brought people together with Native Americans in a way that we haven't seen in this country for a new kind of occupation, which lasted eight months um, or more. Uh, and uh, the entire climate movement really, I would argue, had its had its initiate, had its um, really jumpstart. Uh, it was reborn in a sense in America with Occupy. They came together with the Keystone XL pipeline fight. And after Occupy radicalized this generation of people, they didn't just go home, they migrated into the new nascent climate movement, which was the anti-fracking movement, which the UK had going just as strongly as we had in, in the early years there of the last decade. The anti-fracking movement, the pipeline resistance movement, going out, putting your bodies on the line. That is what Occupy showed the new generation that you have to do. You want to try to stop climate change? You want to get the attention of the people in power and say, we're not going to have this? You got to actually put yourselves out there and demand that it stop. And people rode out in their kayaks or out of C Seattle to stop Shell from moving their platform out into the waters to drill for more oil. They blocked oil trains, coal trains, natural gas uh, export terminals. They shut down pipeline projects across the country, uh, one after the next, and various fossil fuel projects. And um, so I think this, this migration from Occupy into the climate movement, into a radicalized, um, uncompromising sort of demand that we will be here to save our future, this moved right into the climate movement and it helped evolve uh, into the Sunrise Movement, which today is really the Gen Z, the youth climate movement uh, mobilizes around the Sunrise Movement and very much the global climate strikes, which of course Greta Thunberg and, and in Europe has really given, given voice to a global youth movement for the climate. But here in the United States, I think that we can just chart that evolution from Occupy and the individuals who are in Occupy to the actual climate movement, um, women's movement, the Me Too movement, Occupy laid the ground for this understanding of economic inequality that once the rich and abusive males of the 1%, the Harvey Weinsteins of the world and the media moguls, the Murdoch, the, the, the um, Roger Ailes of Fox and uh, all of them, Bill O'Reilly, once these wealthy white men were caught uh, abusing or, or, or with discrimination or simply harassing women, uh, you know, people, feminists I talked to said that Occupy had really prepared the ground for people like Gloria Steinem and other feminists to come and say, you know, this is also economic abuse. It is, it is, it is against women, but it's also by the elite. It helped people understand that it was the same people in a sense uh, at the top sliver of our society who feel they could get away with it because they always had that helped pave the way for people to have that understanding and readiness to embrace me too, uh, to condemn that sense of entitlement uh, and, 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 and abuse uh, by, by, by rich white men who had always done what they've pleased. Um, I think that the women's march, the way it had been decentralized. Activism, we can just see, uh, and with the March for Our Lives to prevent a uh, gun, uh, killings in America, led by teenagers using many of the same techniques that Occupy did. It's a full decade of radicalized activism that Occupy helped birth. And I think that it's just, uh, it's obvious to me. And I think that anyone looking honestly at the previous decade would have to chart these last trends back to Occupy and how it began that. Um, I would say, uh, ah, I believe my time is practically up, isn't it? But uh, the politics uh, were profoundly changed by Occupy. Bernie Sanders, the message of Elizabeth Warren, first off to change the Senate 
and create a new democratic um, progressive vision for for one of the two major American parties was a uh, was a profound shift. It led to Bernie Sanders and his political revolution, taxing the billionaires, taking on corporate greed. That message never would have resonated. He was a lone voice shouting into the wilderness in American politics for decades. Once Occupy had given Americans that language, it was ready for new a new version of progressive anti-corporate democratic politics, not the Obama Clinton version of Democrats, the new Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the whole new wave of Democrats. So Occupy really spurred this political change. And now the measures that we all see being debated in our US Congress uh, for trillions of dollars to give increase health care, uh, eliminate student debt or create debt free college, let children uh, go to preschool for free and have parents, all of these issues that are and taxing the rich to do all this. This was all these, these were radical priorities a decade ago, and now they are mainstream. They are right in the mainstream of the American conversation. Occupy helped put them there. And I think now I'll hand it over to Sarah because the final way was the labor movement in the way that the fight for a $15 minimum wage, the 99% um, Walmart strikes, the nationwide teacher strikes, when labor finally came out and joined this movement, Occupy Wall Street, it signaled this revitalization of uh, a workforce that had been really crushed under Ronald Reagan when he essentially dismantled and, and, and crushed the air traffic controller strike in 1981 and laid the ground for basically a decade of Wall Street greed at the expense of workers. Workers have been really put down to the to the sort of the ground and they they reemerged with Occupy and we've just seen this flourishing uh, ever since. And now the great resignation and this economy of workers uh, taking more charge, which Sarah I'm sure we'll talk about, I think absolutely has its ties to Occupy and this new consciousness of the 99%. So with that, I pass it over. Thank you. Michael, thanks so much. That's really, it, it, I mean, it paints such a great picture. And I, and I, and I think this, this idea of the mainstreaming of, of, of this radical potential is, is, is a key part of the legacy of what, of what Occupy has been. And also it's been one that's been relatively visible. So I'd love to take up later on this idea of the sort of handing onto the baton, as it were, into other movements and other directions and, and, and whether that takes everything with it or whether there've been elements of you know, iteration and transformation along the way as well uh, of, the, of the journey of that kind of initial Occupy impetus. Um, Sarah, you know, you've written about this uh, in Necessary Trouble. You did a lot of reporting, of course, on the Occupy movement that year and subsequently. And, and as Michael rightly says, you've thought about this a lot in respect to labour in particular. So really looking forward to hearing your thoughts uh, on, on, on the same legacy from a slightly different from a slightly different angle. So, Sarah, over to over to you. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, it's slightly early where I am, so I'm, I'm just waking up a little bit. But um, yeah, I wanted to start off with a little story from a thing that I went to during Occupy. I was in New York at the time. Um, I was a journalist. I was working for a website called Alternet. Um, and so I was going to things. At first, I kind of had to fight my boss to tell him that this thing was worth covering and then it started to blow up. And so um, he decided to do a total about face and my coworkers and I who had been covering this thing from the beginning suddenly were um, the golden children because we had discovered this thing that was happening. Um, and so one of the things that happened at Zuccotti Park in particular was that sort of celebrities, both celebrities in general and celebrities of the left would show up and give talks. And so Angela Davis came to town, which thrilled me because I am the world's biggest fan of Angela Davis. And so she gave a talk at Washington Square Park, which is not Zuccotti Park, interestingly, but um, she was, you know, she's giving her talk through the people's mic like everyone did. And for anybody who doesn't know what the people's mic was, it was a technique that Occupy in New York created because they weren't allowed to have amplified sound in the park. And so instead, people would say something and then they, the crowd would repeat it so that everybody could hear it. And it became... Well, I could talk for hours about the people's mic, but um, suffice it to say, it was a really interesting tool that became both useful for actual communication and also for um, protests and shutting things down in itself. Anyway, so through the people's mic, somebody asked Angela Davis a question about how do we make sure that this isn't just another revolution? And I hear it in my head in those tones of the people's mic. 
Um, and Angela Davis sort of starts laughing, right? Because she is very aware that this is not actually the revolution. Um, and she's like, I think it would be great if this was another revolution. Um, and I've been thinking about that lately because where we are now um, on the clock of the world, as they say, um, is a moment where we kind of desperately need a revolution, right? Like um, I was just reading this morning about fossil fuel executives essentially now trying to pass laws banning people from boycotting energy companies and that the um, transition away from fossil fuels is somehow discrimination. Um, so we're just in a, a total mess. Um, I'm in the US and we are watching the complete breakdown of any usefulness of our institutions of government. Um, Biden, you know, a lot of people when I was in the UK this summer were like, oh, but Biden's saying, oh, he's going to do this and he's going to do that. And I was like, call me when things pass the Senate, because that is, of course, the key feature of American politics. And it was the key feature of American politics when Occupy got started, that we had Barack Obama, yay, wonderful, great, right? Hope and change. Um, you had, at least for a minute, a 60 vote majority in the Senate. So that is theoretically the line that it takes to break to actually pass anything in the US Senate because of the filibuster, which again, I can explain if you want me to, but you probably don't want me to. And still nothing was happening. And certainly when it came to the recovery from the crisis, nothing was happening that was helpful for most people, which is to say most working people. And we had you know, a while where certainly the sort of institutionalized progressive, well, I won't even call it movement, the progressive institutions were giving Obama a chance to get things done, right? And what that meant is that the Tea Party was the big movement that happened in the US in response to the financial crisis, which was terrible because um, they were wrong about everything. And so when Occupy happened, it was not just that Occupy brought protest back, because I want to remind everyone that the protests against the Iraq war were the biggest global protests up until that point. And I think up until this past summer with the Black Lives Matter iteration that happened in 2020. So it's not that there weren't protests and it's not that people weren't taking the streets and disrupting things even, but it was a disconnect from the politics of people's actual lives in the place where they were in global North countries in the U S and the UK um, that I think Occupy helped bring us back to that I think is the significant part here. And this is where it connects to labor also, but it's also where it connects to changes to the existence of something like Black Lives Matter, um, a shift away from what Nancy Fraser calls progressive neoliberalism, right? Which was, again, Obama was sort of the perfect avatar of progressive neoliberalism and Bill Clinton too, since you started off talking about Bill Clinton and certainly Hillary Clinton, right? Where the thing was going to be solved by us electing these people who are, some identity that hasn't been elected to this office before and therefore themselves in their body is sort of an avatar of change. And that was very clearly not working and it's very clearly not working right now, even though Joe Biden is the opposite of any of those things. Um, so we got class politics back is what I mean. And that again is where it connects to the labor struggles that have been happening. And again, before Occupy, there were the protests in Wisconsin that was earlier in 2011 when Scott Walker, who is the governor of Wisconsin, newly elected Tea Party governor, decided to ban collective bargaining for public sector workers, which a sentence like that is something that like, I was one of five people in America who um, wrote about such things at the time. I'm one of like 20 now, so it's fine. There's a few more of us, it's great. Um, we did not think that that was going to be a thing that exploded, and yet it did. There were massive protests and occupations in the Capitol building in Wisconsin for months. Um, John Nichols has argued that it was the closest thing to a general strike we've seen in recent years, and I think he's probably right in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it set off this understanding that actually people, working people are aware that they're getting screwed, that they have been getting screwed and that it's not actually their fault that the economy crashed and that maybe we should do something about it that helps them rather than blames them. 
Um, so that also kicked off similar protests in Ohio, where they actually succeeded in overturning the anti-union bill, and even in Indiana, where they did not succeed in overturning it. And of course, in Wisconsin, it was not, although there's a different governor now, at least. Um, so the return of class politics, again, I guess what I'm saying here and bringing up these other things is that we can't just talk about Occupy in a vacuum as the thing that made all of these other things happen, but actually that Occupy was part of a shift that I think we get because, you know, in 2009, you would see publications like The Economist running headlines like Capitalism at Bay. It was a moment where we suddenly could talk about capitalism again. And that is something that was very different from, as Michael was saying, that the, the left, such as it was in the 90s, or as Simon noted, the only thing we had was no logo and, and bless Naomi Klein for being the beacon in the dark. Also, we're talking on Noam Chomsky's birthday, so I can't talk about the 90s and beacons in the dark without saying happy birthday to Noam Chomsky. Um, but so all of a sudden, we can talk about capitalism and we can talk about the structures that are actually creating these things. It's not just that the guys on Wall Street are uniquely evil, although certainly some of them try to prove that they're uniquely evil every day, but it's actually that the entire structure of this thing is designed to screw over people like us and put money in the pockets of people like um, Jamie Dimon and Jeff Bezos. And that is one of the key um, lessons of it. And I'm sure we'll talk more about the labor struggles. Um, I just want to mention a few other things that were really significant, the Chicago teachers strike in 2012 and the fight for 15, which again, started in New York and specifically with the fight for 15, a lot of people who had been involved in Occupy, a lot of the organizers who had been key in bringing unions and community groups down to this protest, which was at its beginning, sort of a thing of, you know, college educated, white folks organizing. They were also the ones who kicked off the fight for 15, which then became a nationwide um, movement is a little bit of a complicated term, but I'm picky about what I will call a movement. Um, but the question of labor um, brings me to something that I think about a lot these days, especially because the, the strikes that we've seen this year, um, we've been seeing some degree of an uptick of strikes, although again, it's very, very easy for it to be overstated how much that's happened, um, especially because the two biggest ones didn't end up happening. They ended up getting deals right before they would have gone out. But one of the challenges and one of the reasons that labor had been weak, is still weak, is that um, essentially when capital can just pick up and move around the globe, it's very hard for labor's strongest weapon, which is the strike, right? Which is the shutting down of production to actually work. Like you can't shut down production to stop your boss from shutting down production. It doesn't work that way. They wanna shut down production. They'll be happy if you go on strike. Um, and so this has been um, created what my friend Joshua Clover who wrote the book, Riot Strike Riot called the affirmation trap. And his argument in that book, which I think is broadly correct is that without the ability of labor to paralyze production the way it had been able to, we have to come up with other ways to disrupt things. This is why he argues sort of the, for the return of the riot, for the distribution struggle, um, and obviously for occupied space as a disruption. Um, and these kinds of um, forays that would go forth from Zuccotti Park to disrupt other things. There was, um, for instance, the panel on educational policy that makes education decisions in New York, where a handful of people, this is where the people's mic comes back in, went to the PEP and shut it down. And what they would just do was one person would stand up and start speaking and everybody would repeat it through the people's mic and that person would get carted off and somebody else would continue. And they essentially shut the whole meeting down. And people started doing that in like Morgan Stanley shareholder meetings. Although again, the tactic lost um, a bit of its efficacy because once people realized what they were going to do, well, it's not quite as disruptive anymore. So this is where we get questions of iteration, questions of where you actually have power and leverage, um, questions of tactics that don't rely solely on the element of surprise. Um, and again, these are all things that we can talk about more in the conversation. Um, one key thing that came through Occupy was, of course, debt and the question of debt strikes. Um, the Debt Collective has successfully pulled off a couple of debt strikes, mostly um, higher education debt, mostly for-profit higher education debt. 
but nonetheless, taking the idea of a union in some way, right? That we all are injured by the same party and that together we have more power than we do alone. And also the saying that, you know, if you owe the bank a hundred dollars, the bank owns you, if, or what, oh, whatever it is, I forget it. But the way that you can actually have power against the bank by refusing collectively to pay your debts in the way that you cannot by yourself, right? The bank will just come after you and get what it gets if you default alone and it will ruin your credit forever. But if enough people refuse to pay their debts, that's something else. And that's a story. Um, quickly, before I wrap up, I want to obviously talk about um, Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn and the Democratic Socialists of America. And there is a meme that I have tried to find repeatedly since seeing it and have never been able to find again that somebody had made. And it was a picture of Occupy at the top. And it was like, in quotes, you know, get serious. You have to run for office, do something political. And then at the bottom was a picture of Bernie Sanders and all these people with Bernie Sanders gear. And it just said, you little shits. Because that was essentially how um, occupiers were treated by people in sort of party politics at the time, right? You needed to do something serious. You, why, why are you occupying a park? You should run for office. You should go vote for Obama again. Um, you should whatever, right? Um, and I presume, though I was not in the UK at the time, that it was very similar from the Labour Party that was like, what are you doing? Why don't you get involved in the Labour Party? And then, of course, when those people do get involved in the Labour Party and in the Democratic Party and support people who actually have similar politics to their own, um, the reaction is to squash them. And we can talk all you want about people being purged from the Labour Party for the crime of thinking that Jeremy Corbyn wasn't the horrible person um, and other fun things. But the swing from the sort of complete horizontalism of the park, which was never as complete as we would have, as well, some people would have liked it to be, to this kind of fully electoral organizing. And then now we're in a bit of a swing in the other direction, right? Because Corbyn is no longer leader of the Labour Party and indeed is no longer um, allowed to call himself a member of the Labour Party, if I understand correctly. Um, Bernie Sanders is the chair of the budget committee in the Senate, which is actually quite important, but is not going to be president. Um, and please don't try to make him run again. The man is old and he needs a break. Um, there are obviously people in elected office in the US and also in the UK that are doing interesting things. But there is now, again, this sort of swing back away from that. And so this is the moment that I think we're in, that it's really interesting to start, start talking once again about the legacies of Occupy, the legacies of these distributed movements, um, the ongoing struggles of Black Lives Matter. Again, I, I want to reiterate that like last summer's Black Lives Matter uprisings around the world were some of the biggest protests um, by sort of sheer amount of people in history and certainly in U.S. history. And yeah, and the questions of organizing and how we do that organizing that all of this leaves us with, um, we still see the sort of attachment to spontaneity that happens when people sort of just start tweeting about a general strike as though if you just tweet about it enough, it's going to come into existence. Um, the emotional pull of identifying or not identifying with a political figure the same way that you might with a movement that you're part of. Um, all of these questions about what happens now. And of course, we have a much shorter time clock in which to accomplish things that have to not just feel good because we're participating in them, but actually have to change the world. Like it's not enough to just have a park that's occupied that feels good that Angela Davis comes and gives his talk to. We actually have to stop them from setting the planet on fire um, and we have to do it soon. So I will end there. Sarah, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for those for those thoughts. And, and you know, I mean, you've, you've you've raised a number of things there. One of the questions again that comes out of my mind is thinking to what extent this kind of era of um, uprising and rebellion and protest is a distinctively left phenomenon. I say there's a lot of sort of you know, especially in Europe, of course, we've seen a large a large swathe of, of, of populist movements on the right and the far right. And I'd be interested to consider that in the context of the legacy of Occupy, recognizing that it's a separate lineage. But I think there's there's something to be seen in, in, in setting those two things alongside each other. But I mean, so much of what you say about the changing tactics of struggle in particular, and about the kind of the the, the way in which, I mean, you, you, you give this a really interesting take from the US perspective, but Sam, your work, 
has come at this partly from a UK perspective, partly also from a more global view. A lot of your work has been done in Latin America and Argentina, and certainly this question of tactics of political struggle, the location. So this whole, the whole, the whole sort of people's mic as a kind of response to the inability to be able to use kind of recorded audio, um, uh, uh, not recorded audio, sorry, but projected audio in in, in a public space very much speaks, Sam, to some of the work that you've been doing around the way in which spaces, different ways of taking space, occupying space, using space within political struggles becomes a key part of what those struggles are able to do. So a perfect moment then to hand over to you and to get a little bit of your sense coming out of your work from the UK and globally on this same story. And uh, we'll look forward to bringing together some of these threads that are emerging uh, when uh, when you finish. So Sam, over to over to you. Right, thanks, Simon. And um, yeah, Sarah will be sad to know that the people's mic never took off here because we were allowed to have mics and, and amps. Um, but yeah, you know, and thanks for putting this together. For me, it's 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 really great having spent you know initially so much time thinking about Occupy to revisit. And I think I agree with with lots or most of really what I've heard. And I think I'll pick up really on what Sarah you were saying at the end there, and try and just push that a bit more and perhaps be a bit more provocative in so doing and just to kind of situate myself and as I mentioned I kind of come at this um, as someone who was initially I guess first and foremost an activist involved in Occupy London in the UK and was doing a PhD at the time and thought well as I'd spent half my PhD you know outside St Paul's at the camp here I may as well have written about it um, but also writing from the UK I think as Simon was hinting that you know that it, it does provide a slightly different kind of vantage point on this. And I think the kind of the headline for what I want to get at building, I think what Sarah said, but just briefly explore it in a bit more depth, is thinking about occupies this kind of, this transition in uh, which what had come before, which I think is largely the kind of iterations of the ultra globalization movement where that led, had kind of been pushed to a, to a limit. And that then kind of broke open into a new situation in which I think Michael talked about the ultra globalization not having um, achieved what it had hoped, or perhaps we can say that the Occupy movement achieved what it didn't hope. Um, to a certain, uh, in a certain sense, some of its biggest failures became some of its biggest successes. Although we can then revisit that in today's conjuncture, which I think you know the points made by Sarah and Simon now are really critical, especially what's happening to the right. Um, so what came before thinking about the kind of ultra globalization movement, and just a heads up in terms of what came next, I think we've already hinted what it led into, which is for me, a combination of, of the party and in particular movement parties, as well as forms of populism, um, and particularly sort of, you know, these hybrid forms, I think it's important to emphasize for me, the initial analysis, and I, I haven't read that much kind of empirical work trying to methodologically trace the legacies of Occupy, although I think, you know, that Sarah and Michaels does a really good job from the US perspective. But the initial analyses seem to be, you know, suggesting that we shouldn't see Occupy as a kind of a sudden return to what came before, i.e. the Vanguard Party, but it, it broke open terrain into new hybrid forms, which are experimental and constantly being reworked and retested. Some people focus on the kind of hybrid in terms of the digital, uh, for me, it's, as Simon said, more questions of strategy and organizational logic and questions of spatiality. Um, so Occupy, as I said, I think was stretching some of the political and organizational logics of the ultra globalization movement kind of as far as they could go. So it was like the event, the situation never ended. Um, you know, we've camped it, there was, there was no end date. It was just to go on indefinitely. Um, a kind of mass coordinated direct action in very centrally targeted locations. Although as some people suggested some of the Southern European targets perhaps worked better because they resonated with the people they were more symbolic. Whereas some of the occupied targets are more in the kind of financial centers, which um, often didn't do that. There was this kind of rejection of everything, both politically and economically, they don't represent us. Capitalism isn't broken. They're really pushing everything to those limits. And then this discussion around horizontality, um, or at least this outward embracing of it, and what, you know, for many of us, I'm sure, at some point became the kind of death by the General Assembly kind of mode of organizing. Um, but talking about it kind of, and I think there was, it, certainly in the UK, so we had, and Sarah, was discussing previously what it meant in terms of this, the mobilizations in the UK. We had a kind of year of student mobilizations. 
anti-cuts movements, um, and also initially before some quite significant urban riots in the UK. But when Occupy happened, there was almost literally physically a symbolic handing over of the baton from a previous generation of the kind of alter globalization activists who were kind of thinking, oh, great, finally, we can, we can take some time out. Um, but, it, you know, and so in saying, you know, that there was this bridge, there was a new generation of activists coming out onto the streets. And for me, that was most symbolically represented. And I might, if there's late, at later time, go back to the Latin American context, which is where I've been mainly researching these last few years. But I remember being in Porto Alegre in 2012 at the a World Social Forum event um, in which different kind of representatives of Occupy and these movements were present. And we walked between different venues. And to do so, we had to cross the Occupy camp in Porto Alegre in Brazil. And there was literally no dialogue, no contact. And then the kind of World Social Forum activists went up into an office overlooking the square. And I just thought, they're so close and yet so far apart. And partly that might speak to the way in which Occupy was picked up in a very different register. And just going on Simon's previous point, when I think about Argentina where I work, it ended up feeding into a kind of right-wing popular discourse against the progressive stroke left popular governments in Latin America. But I'll leave that point hanging. Um, and obviously the other big difference is, is the conjuncture vis-a-vis -vis the ultra-globalization movement in terms of austerity less kind of summit hopping and more kind of locally territorially rooted struggles directed against kind of political institutions. So briefly to summarize my title, just mentioning kind of three legacies um, and maybe bring it back up to speed because I think what Sarah and Simon were getting at is really important there. So the first question about what it means for democracy and, and the so-called is, you know, was that the end of horizontality? Um, there's been some really great books coming out recently. Um, Paulo Gerbaldo and Rodrigo Nunes has just got a book out looking at horizontality and verticality. And I think that's where it's interesting to think what the kind of the horizontality was taking it to its very extreme limit. And I completely agree, Sarah. Obviously, there was all kinds of hidden powers and dominations, which in some cases were extremely violent within occupied camps. But nevertheless, there was an attempt to push it to its limit. Did that then mean there was a sudden, you know, bang towards um, super verticalist organizing? No, but nevertheless, what we did see was a return to the political party and what I think then people have been talking about as movement parties, but from the streets. So parties led by the streets. And there was this kind of uh, relatively quick professionalization in some cases of a kind of newly emerging digital cadre um, you know, the activists were, were evicted from the camps, but as Michael was saying, they're very much, they were there to stay. And there was an attempt to kind of reinstitutionalize the form then from the camp, which ended up being in the party. And I think that took some interesting journeys along the way, often, and especially in the European context, rather the urban neighborhoods was the kind of path it took. And as we know, it led to both new political parties, Podemos being one of the most famous in the Spanish context, or kind of the revitalization from the streets of existing parties. And they've already been talking about the kind of Labour, um, Corbyn, uh, Bernie Sanders kind of moment. So we could go back more into that, but there, there's a clear legacy of the kind of movement from the horizontality to verticality, but a kind of hybrid form and this unexpected embrace of the political party who were, you know, uh, banned, in the case of you, Occupy London, political parties were banned from having any presence there, any stalls. They were literally hounded off the camp. Um, so at the same time, then thinking about the question of horizontality to verticality, what I mentioned about thinking about populism, right? Um, and how that, the, the kind of the limits to, the end of the alter globalization movement, very much centered on questions, I think, of autonomy within the left, led to this new age of populism um, and popular demands suddenly being articulated by this renewed, unexpected hope, to go back to the point I was saying at the beginning, unexpected hope in the democratic institutions. And it's interesting that what, you know, what came first and the, the kind of transformations through the camps and on the streets in London, New York, and Madrid, or the transformations within the political parties that provided a, a, a kind of moment of hope. And, you know, Latin America at that time had clearly, or well, was still providing a very viable sense of the, of the possibilities, depending on your 
kind of political stance that there was opportunity to convert some of that energy into institutional reform and particularly kind of participatory forms of democracy. So there was a moment of hope looking towards that. Um, so democracy, horizontality, shifting towards the form of the movement party and, 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 new, and these, these new revitalized debates around populism, which have been alive in kind of Latin America for a while and then were imported, obviously most directly and most explicitly by activists in the Podemos um, context in Spain. And on that, I think the work of people like you know, Cristina Flesher from Inaya, who've traced the kind of the trajectory of the indignados to Podemos in that, you know, really useful kind of work to think about how that happened, very complicated. The final point I wanted to make, it's kind of obligatory one as, as a fellow geographer here on the panel, is thinking about some of the spatiality of this all and the kind of, I suppose they're rather simple, but nevertheless uh, provocative reading of, of the kind of auto globalization movement, which is all about transnational um, networks, was this kind of moment of territorializing, which as I suggested, I think was provoked by austerity being posed nationally and locally and subnationally, and the need to kind of confront and resist that. And that's what it came out of in the UK in terms of the anti-austerity movements. So there was this rooting in place, which perhaps from Sarah's perspective is really interesting to think about in terms of what it meant for labor organizing, organizing in place, which again has become very hybrid, right? Both kind of digital, but still rooted in place. Um, but also this kind of uh, strategic commitment to trying to transform reality by occupying space and what that actually means and an acknowledgement of the limits of doing so from within the protest camp. People were prefiguring alternative worlds, but the need to re-territorialize beyond the camp and what we saw in many, many cases then was a shift once people had kind of broken out of that kind of fetish of the camp uh, in a sense, there was a relief when there was that moment of eviction because people said, we're never going to leave ever. To that then free people up to re-territorialize in neighborhoods and communities in the UK. There was a strong link with the kind of squatters movement and they already had established um, work kind of engaging with communities. And then further re-territorializing that both to the, the urban scale. There were some attempts to do that in London, but again, the, perhaps the best example is that things like Barcelona and Como in Spain and the new municipal movement that, that's, that spawned, as well as, of course, the national scale with kind of momentum, labor, um, Sanders and so on. So what went wrong then, if we can think about, and this is again what Sarah was touching on at the end, and, and I think Simon also hinting at, if we can see the kind of bigger successes coming out of its failures, but looking at the conjuncture today in 20, the end of 2021, when if this event had been happening two years ago, we might have been optimistically talking about, you know, being on the, on the, you know, the edge of living in a kind of international socialist republic of Sanders, Corbyn, Iglesias, but alas, the kind of the populist moment is currently seemingly tilting the other way. And we only have to look towards Chile, again, to go back to Latin America, to see very dangerously where that might be going. And it's interesting that the possible legacy of a mass two year cycle of mobilization in the streets in Chile is possibly leading to the election of a um, far right populist. Um, so was it that this new cadre of activists who've been handed over the baton lacked experience. As Gramsci says, right, it's easier to form an army than it is to form generals. And what comes next now then, you know, and this is perhaps where the conversation may go, this conjunction, which we know that the state, the kind of the big state is clearly here to stay. And certainly activists need to continue to confront head on these very thorny issues of political strategy, an organization which at the very minimum is something that we can be grateful to occupy for putting center stage of our discussion, these questions of strategy and organization. So um, I think my time's just about out, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Sam, thanks so much for those, for those thoughts as well. And um, all of you for, for wonderful contributions. I mean, th there's a huge number of issues raised, doesn't surprise me. Uh, this touches on a great deal of the political language that we're all working with in the current context and it's it's really just so fascinating to reflect upon where that's come from 
and where it's been before it's got to us. And, and, and so in a sense, that's the first question that I wanted to, in response to what you've all been saying, kind of put back to you is to, is to get us to think a little bit more about the, about these, about the periodization of, of Occupy and setting it in both a broader and perhaps even also a narrower frame. So by a broader frame, I'm thinking, you know, Sarah, you raised this partly in terms of some of your, your analogies, but if we, if we go back, when were the previous moments where this kind of structural transformation took place? So for me, that is the kind of cusp of the late 60s, early 70s. That was the previous moment when we had this kind of schismatic transformation in the extent and the willingness and the type, type being the critical element, the type of protest and transformation in political language and voice. What we had back then was a whole series of intersectional arrangements. We had a whole series of efforts to use public space against the state, the post-war welfare liberal democratic state, but which had been in the context of Cold War kind of transformed into ironically a relatively oppressive state for certain groups of individuals, whether that was classed by gender, by race, by sexuality. And then in a sense, for me, that is the moment, the litmus point, as it were, to which Occupy 2011 and all that comes thereafter emerges out of. But it's not simply that the one echoes the other, because there's a lot obviously that happens in between. And one of the things that we get in between is a loss of a certain form of political language. So I, I, I mentioned sort of slightly facetiously earlier on what the 90s did and didn't give us. But they did give us two things. They gave us, first of all, the kind of the dying urges of mid late 20th century social democracy, that form of left politics. And Michael, you pointed this out as well, and it's in your book too this idea that that kind of progressivism is sufficient to waylay what happens in a capitalist economy kind of filtered and, and went by the wayside. And I think one reaction to that was the global alter movement that you've been describing, Sam, this kind of, this, this rediscovery of a global plane and the language of networks that came with that. But in a sense, that was always targeted the wrong way. It was targeted out there, this kind of large, multifaceted globalization essentially kind of para concept when the reality what was driving some of those movements was much more domestic and was much more rooted in class experience and the lived experience of individuals from their particular gender and race and so forth so i wonder whether in a way what happens with occupy is it's a kind of boiling over of some of those elements and michael again i mean you you also pointed us to the to the noughties to what happened during the two, during the 2000s the post 2001 moment in the us and of course a lot of that and it was also a flowering of, 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 of anger on the streets in many ways, and not simply contained to the US, but it was very civic political. And of course, what happened to Occupy is that becomes socioeconomic, and it becomes about the structures which suddenly take center stage. So I guess in throwing this a little bit back to all of you, I'd love to hear your thoughts a bit about, about the, the wider historical uh, importance of Occupy when we put it in this sort of bigger perspective of, 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 of global trends and, and, and social transformations that have, that have erupted. OK, and that also then makes me think a little bit about, well, what then are we heading to next? You know, where, in a sense, as Sam pointed out at the end of his comments, where where is this taking us? And for me, almost the answer for that lies in a bit of a bit, a bit of a black hole for me. And Sarah and, and Michael, I don't know whether you'd be able to fill this in. But, you know, what happened immediately after the evictions? You know, we've got the sense of where where Occupy has gone and the legacy of it in other movements where it's been taken up. But literally, what then were the first next steps because I kind of feel that that's, a, that's an unpainted part of the picture in many people's mind. You know, there were these moments, there was this global eruption, and then the lid was put on. What then happened to bring people, to push them, Michael, perhaps in the context of your book, into these other movements? So they became these new vanguards in different contexts. And in a sense, Occupy then did have its kind of intersectional moment in Me Too and, and, and in Black Lives Matter, what had been a lot of, as Sam points out, missing, in a sense, in in, in, in the politics of the, of, of the camps themselves. So it'd be great to get your perspective, all of you on those kind of larger historical dynamics in which we can locate Occupy and begin to think in that sense about its resonance and, and legacy, both nationally, but also, but also very much globally. Is that turning, shall I begin? Do you wanna, do you wanna kick off Michael? And then, yeah, and then Sam yeah. and Sarah just, just do come in as, as, as you feel. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, um... I think Sarah actually hit it kind of uh, in, in just briefly toward the end of her talk. I think that by uncovering capitalism, the system, I think Occupy did this immeasurably useful uh, thing for our global culture, because as we've all been talking about, neoliberal politics is just what the modern age is. It's what we've been living with since, you know, th this kind of boom since 19... 
uh, 50s and 60s uh, style, Chicago stool, school economics, privatizing, deregulating, which ended up shipping jobs overseas, profits going up to the, to the wealthiest, to the shareholders. It is just the way we've lived. And Occupy finally exposed. It was really like taking the clothes off of the emperor, showing, showing just what capitalism as a system um, means and how it's how it's devastating uh, the the sort of the usefulness and, and the meaning in our lives. Something that all of this talk about workers and what Sarah's work has done in subsequent years. Um, I think that that was really the profound impact. Um, that, that it did. It allowed us to have this discussion because once the world, it was as though we could all finally see through the corruption and see what crony capitalism, how it's impacting big business with politics around the world. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It's the money that's controlling the choices that the public should be making in the interest of the public, right? It's all about the money. And we discussed it and we said it out loud and that allowed this flourishing of, of, new, of new possibilities. What I would say in terms of where we're going forward, and I'm glad that, uh, that, that Sam brought up movement parties. I think this idea, you know, Occupy was this eruption. It was uncontained, it was chaotic, it was disorganized, it was original. And it didn't know where it was going. And it didn't actually really uh, intend to go anywhere beyond occupying space, as we say. It was kind of in that sense, like a juvenile in that way, like a really adolescent style movement. It was literally adolescent. It was young people didn't want part in the system, didn't believe in the dual party, Democrat, Republicans, weren't gonna put up people to elect. But what we've seen, I think when we look ahead at the future and when Sam's talking about Podemos party, or you can talk about the cities of party in Greece or the five star movement for all of their flaws, these populist parties of, you know, more or less the left, um, but kind of the, you know, alternative, they sort of blend left and right. Um, and you can even look at the, uh, the yellow vests in France, which I think is a really good model of a genuine 99%, not left or right explicitly, but really populist economic um, movement. I think that we see that Occupy was this early stage, but what we grew in America at least, is we grew this new progressive political movement. Many of the people from Occupy went on to train younger activists not to do an unstructured, protest in the streets. It's all about occupying and making your demands and getting angry and getting media attention and having this spectacle. That's one piece of it. But I think that how we have evolved and where we must evolve, unless we want a complete anarchic breakdown, and then it's everyone for themselves. And I think we know where that finishes, because we're seeing the right wing populism emerge very loudly right now to tell us how that can finish as we saw January 6th in the Washington insurrection in America. Um, I think if we don't want that route and we wanna do the political reforming and changing the system from within, I think we've started to do that and the actual Occupy um, uh, momentum created from Occupy, it showed the new generation that you can't just uh, protest and do these like the anti-globalization, like protests, you need to get into the system. You need to get elected into office. You need to drive movements that drive political parties that drive policies that you want. And they learned that. And the actual Occupy organizers helped form these movements. One of them was called Momentum. And I talk about it in the book, which trained younger activists, not just to, to, to go out and be activists, but to actually drive policy at the same time and push legislators like, say, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to push the Green New Deal. That came from activists pushing, which got it into the mainstream dialogue and it then became uh, the Green New Deal was something all Democratic presidential candidates had to address in the 2020, in the 2019 primaries and the 2020 election. Um, so I think we're seeing this process and what Sam said with movement parties, other countries already picking it up. The right wing, which is a really important part of this debate because they really have taken sort of charge of this new era of populist momentum and movements. Um, but I don't think the right wing has a whole lot of ideas about how to fix things. They have anger, they have xenophobia, they have uh, resentment, uh, 
and a, a sense of a loss of what's being taken from them from a generally white working background, but I don't think they have proposals and they never really have that can actually benefit the mass of working people, families, the 99%. The I think that the more we go into the system and change it from inside as our more progressive leaders are starting and trying to do, at least on this, at this side, and, and I think England is, Britain is clearly ready for that, um, for, for something new to come on, on a political line. I think that that's how we do this. I think that has to be part of the future, uh, not simply demonstrating to shut it down. Sarah, Sam, do you do you agree with that? The the uh, the, the you know this 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 reinvigoration of the party or the party form. You know, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the sociology, political science lit literature of the last 15, 20 years has been on about how the you know the the traditional post. 45 political parties on the decline, the class coalitions it's based upon are not there anymore, and so on and so forth. Is this then the necessary impulse to rethink what a political party does, let alone in that sense, before you even get to the question of who it's representing? Because of course, that's a whole other part as well. And there are new, and you get this in the States more so even than in the UK, you've got whole different dynamics, whole different whole different uh, electorates, really, in effect, than other that you're talking about, especially going forward the next 5, 10, 15 years. So is that something that you both see as well? So, I mean, we don't really have political parties in the US. We have um, the Democrats and the Republicans, which aren't real parties, as, as you mostly have them in most other reasonable places um, that you could be a member of and have some say in what actually happens within them. We just have a line on a ballot sheet and you register as a member of it so you can vote in primary elections. And that's basically it. You have no say otherwise in what it is and what it does. And the Democratic Party, I sort of constantly have to remind people, is not a party. It's a group of mostly rich white people based in DC and their donors. And the people who have the influence in that party are the people who take the phone calls when the fundraising time comes around. So, um, but I wanted to go back to the question that you asked before about sort of what happened when the parks closed, because I think this is important, again, to make us think about what kinds of organizations are happening and are maybe necessary in this moment. Um, and I have not read Rodrigo Nunes's book yet, but I've been listening to um, his conversations with various people on various podcasts, and I'm really looking forward to it because I think it's going to be... Interesting. Um, so what happened in New York after the park got evicted is um, there was a short lived attempt to occupy homes that was much more successful in a few other places, specifically, um, I think it was most developed in Minneapolis and in Atlanta, where um, a mixture of defending people from eviction who were in at risk of losing their homes to um, foreclosure, because this was still, of course, during the ongoing foreclosure crisis. Um, and that necessitated different forms of organization, as well as different forms of political practice. So if you are going to risk arrest by camping out on somebody's lawn so that when the sheriffs come to evict them from their home, they can't do it, you need to have a level of trust built in. You end up building actual organizations. You end up having, you know, sort of complicated struggles about leadership and power that were a little less submerged than they were in the parks. And um, I wrote about this in my book. I think it's a really interesting um, direction that things went into. Other people became labor organizers and went into organizing some of the big campaigns that we've seen now, whether that be tech worker organizing. Um, a few people that I knew from Zuccotti Park are now um, lead organizers in both the News Guild and the Writers Guild, doing a lot of the organizing among digital media right now. Um, other people were in the fight for 15. And that again, is bringing the kind of analysis that Occupy had, but also the kind of political tactics that Occupy had. Um, there was a formation for a little while in New York called 99 Pickets, which was, again, a bunch of labor-aligned Occupy folks who would essentially do the things that the union is not legally do because, um, I mean, the trade union laws in the UK are also incredibly strict and restrictive of what the union can and can't do when on strike or when not on strike, but they are similarly strict in the U US. And so essentially this was an activist group that would um, do the things that the union could get in trouble for doing. And so that was bringing, again, a sort of Occupy style 
tactic to an organization that has a historical form um, that's a bit different, right, to the union um, or to the worker organization. So we see these two things sort of mashed together in a variety of ways. And I think that that, um, again, when the strike is not necessarily working the same way the strike used to work, the introduction of different tactics of occupying space and causing trouble in different ways of bringing um, allies to the action when things like the fast food strikes or the Walmart strikes first started. Um, one of the ways that you would prevent people from getting fired if they went on strike, because these were, again, not workplace shuttering strikes. These were a handful of workers going on strike. Is it you would just bring 20 of your best friends to walk them back into work the next day when they went back into work after being on strike, including in some cases, New York City, well, now New York City public advocate, Jamani Williams, who was in the city council at the time. Um, and so these connections and these structures that get built out of that moment, um, they are, as you said, often missed in the story. And one of the things that, that frustrates me, again, I sort of alluded to the like hashtag general strike tweeting, um, is that we essentially hear the stories and the big, exciting, dramatic moments and not the things that go on in between. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly it. This is why, you know, the question about what, what comes after, because you've got to build something. And if it's not going to be the continuation of that big, large movement, because that's the, you know, the, the, the horizontalism kicks in, then it's got to be other things. And so it's, it's fascinating to see how this then pushes into other areas and sections. Sam, is that something that you sort of recognize as well and see in the, in the, in the UK context? I mean, just jumping off what Sarah said then, because you mentioned before this the example of the hashtag strike, and not everyone goes on strike. And for me, what happened after the camps and, and um, Jeff Juris, the late Jeff Juris, wrote really well about this when he talked about the camps were great, this log logic of aggregation. They could bring everyone together, but they didn't always have much of a clue what to do afterwards. And the problem is when they were then evicted, uh, we didn't even really have an email list in, in, in the Occupy London. It was like, what do we do now? So there was this need to then to learn how to, how to organize, basically. And I, I think in the US, from what I'm hearing and what, what I know from people there, that people did a really good job. They went and became like organizers and using that, especially that terminology over there, um, which then also led to questions of institutions and institutionalization. Um, just because then it'd be nice to have, to, I guess, time to hear from others. In terms of this big question, which you're always really good at both asking and answering as well, Simon, um, you know, what, the, you know, this, this big conjunction, 2011, and I think I've already kind of hinted at what one of the, the readings, which, you know, and through a Latin American lens as well, and, you know, and Michael mentioned it in terms of the populist moment, but, you know, the end of the post-political, post-democratic, is that what we see? And obviously, the, you know, we know a number of the people that have been kind of discussing this, uh, obviously, you know, Chantal Mouf, most famously, particularly excited in the last 10 years moving around. Now, that obviously can be taken too far in one extreme, but there's certainly something in that. And as we know, it, there, there's a day, there's both an opportunity, but a danger in that populist moment, because in the UK it, and you know, in the US, we know all the things that it led to, right? And Brexit and, and Trump and the rest of it. Um, but it's very real, right? And again, Latin America, I think, provides a useful lens where they went through moments of occupying and that kind of uh, street organizing in the late 90s. They then went into the institutions. And in some ways, they're always a few years ahead of us in the conjuncture. And they've been through their populist right. And they're now in this kind of swinging back and forth. And it's really messy to work out what's the current conjuncture there. And I suppose just the very final point to throw out there, final question is, was it the kind of marking one of the last big movements against neoliberalism as that slowly dies? But I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks. Yeah, so I mean, let's bring in some some questions from the floor now. Then, I mean, there's 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 a couple. There's one that we've got here, which is really, I, I guess, it touches upon the parallel story to the to the movement party that we've been discussing. You know, that's one one legacy, perhaps, the transformation of the party system broadly broadly understood. Okay, recognizing transatlantic differences. Um, the other side is is non party political ways of 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 doing doing politics and you know whether that's in things like citizens assemblies whether it's in things like uh, panels reference panels or votes by votes by lot taking rather than than through majority type type, type systems 
there is a flowering in my sense of new ways of thinking and approaching uh, the way in which we do politics. Not all of these are taken up yet. There's also a flowering of the way in which coming, Sam, a little bit to your points uh, about, about kind of locality and building this into neighborhoods, but also I'd add institutions, you know, new ways of thinking politically and being engaged within the state, you know, within the public sector, engaging with local communities as part of the way in which policies are enacted as well as politics is done. Do any of you see any, any kind of trends in that direction or things that you think are particularly particularly hopeful or, 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 or that you fear may, may ultimately just fiddle out after a fizzle out after, after some time? I'm unclear what, what, what precisely, um, or maybe Sam, take it. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll just make a brief comment, which is for me, it, it's, a, it's a kind of early to say, but the point I was making before to reiterate, which I think is important, is the kind of ongoing experimentation with organization to go back to this kind of vertical horizontal hybrids, but there's, a, there's ongoing experimentation. I think something that's refreshing is it's not like it was, okay, let's just try the Vanguard party, oh, that doesn't work, let's go back. There's this ongoing tweaking and experimentation with all kinds of different combinations. And I think, and learning, you know, trying to learn quickly from what went right and what went wrong with the kind of momentum Corbyn experience in the UK and the, and the Bernie Sanders. So for me, that kind of self reflexivity in itself is really important. That kind of partly comes out of the assembly form, which obviously famously was based on consensus and constantly tweaking things. But the capacity that activists for me is showing, and that's been demonstrated in some of the Southern European kind of organizations there, to constantly experiment, but not kind of get stuck in a way. And, and this kind of sense that it might take a bit of time to figure out a kind of form and no one's rushing to kind of fetishize that they did the protest camp and giving that kind of breathing room in time. So it's not really an answer per se, except that I think that the ongoing experimentations with vertical horizontal hybrids the digital, the in-person, different scales. You know, this is a debate at the moment, new, municip new municipalism, is, it, is the city what really matters? I know they're saying, no, we've got to take national scale, and that, those debates have been had, but actually, can you think about these things simultaneously and then bring in the community? So for me, that's the exciting thing. So Mike, Michael, the, I guess the version of the question, that question for you is, is, is from Magic Altman here in, 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 the, in the panel, in the attendees list here, is, is it time for People's Assembly? Huh, for People's Assembly? Yeah, I mean, I, why not? Isn't it ever? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I would say to, you know, <clears throat> to the big question of where is the movement? Where are we now? And right. when will it arrive? When will we arrive? Uh, what I'm kind of amazed about actually, and it's sort of a testament to how strong the pull of capitalism, the pull of neoliberal style. I think that this pandemic, I think the coronavirus has done us in that sense, a great service in that it has accelerated. It's obviously a tragedy, millions of lives lost, jobs lost, people with instability, so much disruption, but it is accelerating this sense of the disequilibrium that may be our new future. Um, what's stunning to me is that more people aren't, aren't taking on, aren't sort of walking away from, in the way that the great resignation now of so many people walking away from their jobs saying, I don't need this anymore. I don't need the health risk. I don't need the low wages. I don't need the lousy conditions. If you can't give me better, I'm out of here. I'll find something else more meaningful to do with my life. What's amazing to me is that young people and the new generation that is sort of really aware, we're not in the no logo Naomi Klein 1990s any longer. We've been dealing with this about corporate control of our democracy now for many, many decades. We're all pretty familiar with it. Yes, Sarah's right. The Republicans and the Democrats, the Democans and the Republicrats. It's a big corporate duopoly. We're aware. And uh, I don't think that's a mystery to anyone. What's amazing to me is that we haven't figured out the old tactic, which I guess you could call boycott, which actually worked many decades ago, and it got people what they wanted. But where is a sense of global, a global movement to boycott the many institutions or companies or industries that are harming us to boycott. I mean, right now you probably wouldn't boycott global pharma because they're happening to produce a vaccine that is helping to save lives, but fossil fuels, 
the banking industry, why alternatives haven't emerged and why we haven't simply united because really finally economic power, it's obviously, we, we learned that, that was the slogan in the Bill Clinton years, it's the economy, stupid. That is what people care about, it's their economic well-being and, and state of life. It, uh, um, general uh, condition, uh, well, it, it, that is what finally people drives people. It's what drives the far right to these movements because their jobs are being taken away. And why we haven't challenged in a serious way through boycotts or through mass in the way that the climate movement may begin to do to, to refuse to take part uh, in, in some of these industry, uh, dominant industries that, um, that refuse to change people, I think the movements need to amass and show their collective economic power through the public banking movement. For example, taking our money out. We don't like that you're investing in fossil fuels, JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo. We're going to take our money out and leave that. Right now that's a fringe movement, but what happens when tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people around the world do that? I think we haven't yet realized that sense of collective power because somehow we haven't organized and we have the technology to organize. Finally, we're at this historic moment where we can all be instantly connected. One meme, one idea can be spread among billions of people overnight if it were the proper idea and if people would get behind it. So to me, it's really kind of at this point right now, a failure of organization. Um, and when you say people's assembly, I hope it's a hell of a lot better organized than a lot of the people's assemblies that I've seen. I hope that there is leadership and that there are people who are responsive to the great mass of, <laughs> of needs out there, but we need serious structural leadership uh, in the way that uh, is all that has ever brought about serious structural change. Well, that that that, that brings us on to, 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 a, to an interesting issue in the light of what we've been discussing we talked all about structures but then what about leadership so i mean sarah one of the other questions here in here in the chat is 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 about i mean the question asks whether there'll ever be an alternative to the two-party system in the u.s right so with democratic socialists green parties and so forth potentially moving forward to to, to occupy some of that space that, that that michael's just been talking about they often rely upon leadership so you know is is that a part of the problem too that 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 as sam says partly that that the legacy has been one of too much horizontalism, or is there a or is there a middle ground that 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 is yet to be kind of seized, and perhaps that middle ground emerges around some of these particular issues? Maybe it's issue specific rather than you know rather than coalition specific as we're used to as we're used to seeing. But what what will be your thoughts on that? I'm so old that my first election I voted for Ralph Nader, and. We've been having this conversation in some way for 20 odd years, at least, um, about what the Green Party was going to become. And the Green Party has not become anything. And we should just be very, very clear about that and admit it. It's not. It's failed. Um, talk about things that have not succeeded in what they set out to do. The Green Party has not. Um, and a lot of this is because of the structures of American politics. Um, that's just what it looks like. Um, we have to think differently than we're going to start a new party by having a celebrity run for president and get 2% of the vote. Um, that's not a strategy. It's bashing your head against a wall. Um, this is my very hot take on the Green Party in the US. Um, Green parties in the Europe are different um, in a variety of different ways, depending on the country. Um, and I am not going to go into that here. But I just think that the problem in so many cases is we're looking at the scale of what we are up against, which is huge. It's planetary. It's terrifying, right? If I start thinking about it, I'm in New Orleans. I'm sit sitting in a city that's not going to exist in 10 to 20 years because it's going to be underwater. Um, so yeah, I, I understand why we start talking about like, oh my God, we've got to do everything at the top right away now, but we actually can't do that. Um, and one of the lessons of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn is that you can't, rather than posing this as horizontalism versus verticalism, I wanna think about it as a failure of organizing sustainably. And again, I don't think that that means that everything has to go through a party, the Vanguard party, whatever it is. Um, but you didn't have the institutions to do the groundwork to actually build the power to actually put these people in power. Um, you didn't, you, we sort of got these Hail Mary shots with these two, bless them, 
guys who had been around saying the same thing for 40 something years. Um, I love that they're still here. It's great. But like that, that question of, of we're just going to do it from the top. It turned out that what we didn't have was the middle layers. And so this is the question that I think is, is really obsessing me. And I, I've been thinking about it a lot since reading Paolo Grabato's wonderful book, The Digital Party, um, which again, we should talk about more. Um, but this question of that layer of people that are gonna be in organizations, that what are those organizations gonna look like? How do they build power? Where do they exercise it? How do we think about that? Because, We've sort of tried the here's everyone. And the problem with here's everyone, as we have alluded to and not really gotten to talk that much about, is that the right wing can also grab onto that. Um, and here's everyone can si sort of just turn into here's no one very quickly. Um, and here's the guy at the top. And we all really love Bernie. OK, but Bernie had some very specific flaws in how he ran his campaign and the issues that he was and was not good at talking about. And we have to also face that. And so, you know, we're in this moment now where, again, like we have to learn the lessons and we have to learn them quickly, but there's not going to be one weird trick that like suddenly makes there a replacement to the Democratic Party sucking um, or that suddenly brings back structural power to the labor movement. These things, you know, I, I going to finish with quoting my friend Jane McAlevey, right? Like on some level, there are no shortcuts. We actually have to do the work of organizing and not just hope that a meme is going to do it for us. That's great. No, and I, and I think, and just as we move towards just the last couple of minutes, and we, we'll have to wrap up in a sec, and I'll, and I'll give you all just 30 seconds, uh, our, our commentators, to sort of to, to, to send us a last, a, last, a last observation and wrap up of, your, of, your, of your, your take on all this. But I mean, I think you're right, Sarah. I mean, I think, and there's another question in the chat here from, from, uh, from Giuliano about, about where those decisions get to be taken. And, and maybe they don't happen actually in the public sphere. Maybe they happen in the movements, in the organizations in the institutions and that's where actually the difficult choices are often going to have to be taken and so i guess the challenge is to try and find ways to leverage the 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 the, the momentum the power and the energy of, of 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 a large scale mass movement but to apply it in that middle ground that you say sarah within the context of actual actual building of new institutional forms and new and new political forms too of the of the sorts of suggestions that we've had in the in the chat today so my thanks to all of you for a wonderful conversation we could we could go on for a lot lot longer it's not going to end here tonight and i do hope we keep considering it i think there's going to be a lot more to discuss in 10 years time as well and it'll be great perhaps to to reconvene then and share stories of who we first voted for and feel even older about ourselves um so it's been a real pleasure thank you sarah thank you sam thank you michael um sam do you want to kick us off with just a last a last comment before we before we leave great thanks and yeah i mean i suppose that the main point is that you know as we confront and make sense of the difficult challenges we face today to to reflect on both what occupy did well and what it didn't do well and i suppose to try and give equal weight to both of those Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, well put. Um, I think there's a real hesitancy sometimes to learn from failures, to admit that there have been failures, um, to sort of lock ourselves into our heroic pasts and not say like, this thing didn't work. Why didn't it work? How didn't it work? What was wrong with it? What was still good about it? Um, because I think that it's in analyzing the things that didn't work and why and how they didn't work, that we will often find the thing that might work next time. Thank you, Sarah. And Michael, finally, over to you. To end on a bit of an optimistic note, I would simply say what uh, the activist and organizer, the late activist organizer, Kevin Zeese, who I interviewed for this book, uh, it was a longtime organizer, said movements don't happen overnight they don't even happen in several years they might not even come to fruition in a generation it was a message that he brings to his activism school that he taught uh with his wife uh for young activists that you can't expect something like an occupy to have this um actual transformative effect maybe even in a decade even though we're 10 years on but that the 20s i think to keep that hope and that sense of building um, and evolution um, of movements alive, I think that we might not need to look for the movement of movements. We have a new decentralized landscape of millions of people active. And I think that 
the real work that Occupy started, the conversation is starting to come to the fore. People, we are there now. It's taken a while. This decade ahead is when we need to make those, those visions more of a reality. Thank you, Michael. We may just need then, as Lenin once said, or rather to, to, to gratuitously twist a phrase, pick up the tools in the street and, and use them. Michael Levitton, Sarah Jaffe, Sam Halverson, thank you all of you for your time uh, this morning, this evening, this afternoon. It's been a great conversation. Really appreciate you coming and sharing your thoughts and uh, thanks for all your work and strongly advise all of those of you listening today or watching on our YouTube channel to, to check out the articles and the books written by by all three of our speakers today, you'll learn you'll learn a great deal indeed. So from me and from the IHSS, thank you and good night.